Facebook, stand by for recording. Good day and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another Little Fuel Show. That's right, we're live streaming on the Facebook world like we've been doing for a couple of months. We are recording on a Sunday fun day, hopefully Sunday fun day for many of you. Uh, for many others in the world, maybe not, because we are, just to timestamp this, we're recording on March 15th, 2020, two days before my one-year wedding anniversary on St. Patrick's Day. Uh, and uh, this is what we do, all right? The commitment to sharing the good word, the truth, and the power of information in the online space. That's why we podcast. I don't really care what day of the week it is or time of the day. So, but I'm excited, ladies and gentlemen, because not just because of podcasting, and I'm always excited about podcasting because it's going on for almost three plus, almost four years, but I've got a doc on the line, ladies and gentlemen, not just any doc, AKA, AKA doctor, but somebody might know a little bit about the healthcare system, but for today, we're going to go with a theme based on his book, Universal Death, Death Care aka universal healthcare, but a solution for healthcare in the age of entitlement. Emphasis on entitlement because he and I were just joking around about the whole first world problems of being able to uplink to high speed internet and the fact that I was skiing all morning and then having to go out and help my wife look to shop for a car for her, her next doctor they're hiring for a veterinary practice. And I made a joke that this is first world problems, but there might be some more to tie to this than that. But again, March 15, 2020, we're in the midst of the, the big explosion of the coronavirus here around the world. And uh, we might cycle that into today's episode as well. So again, let me give you a quick skinny on this doc. He's not just a doctor, ladies and gentlemen, he's also a veteran. That's right, he served overseas and uh, I honor, honor any man or woman who serves in our, our forces. I have never served in the military. I served as obviously a federal hotshot wildland firefighter as part of my backstory of the show and the brand. Uh, but anyway, let me give you a quick scene of this gentleman. Marine Corps, Special Forces, Combat Doc, fighting to save lives while dealing with mass casualty events and incoming rockets, converted to owning a busy medical clinic in the USA, fighting to provide you know, quality medical care, while dealing with ill-advised government regulations, which I will agree with, and excessive profit-driven policies by insurance companies. I think we can all might just a little bit connect on this. And uh, maybe some price gouging with Big Pharma. And uh, this gentleman might have a unique insight into what the healthcare has become and what it costs each of us as patients. So without further ado, not just a veteran, not just former military, and again, author of Universal Death Care, without further ado, Dr. Reagan Anderson, sir, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Honored to have you, sir. So again, thank you again for your service. And uh, I take that very seriously. Like my garage out back, I literally have flags covering every single window. <laughs> nice. So my neighbors know not to go anywhere near that. I don't know if they actually are maybe they're afraid of the building. I don't know. Like you ever notice that like, people just stay away from it. <laughs> I yeah, literally I have, have a, eight windows and they're all covered in flags. <laughs> at my quote unquote welcome mat in my house, it's a Marine recon uh, symbol. So if anybody doesn't get the hint with, you know, there's guns in this house and you're being videotaped, uh, they'll have Marine <laughs> recon uh, doormat to walk past. So yes. There you go. I, I, I love it. I mean, uh, yeah. So I, I've got a couple of standard, obviously, you know, stars and stripes flags. I've got, uh, fallen firefighter flag, fallen police flag, you know, thin red line, thin blue line. Then I created the first ever thin violet line to honor fallen wildland firefighters. Actually, the flag company said I was the first one ever to grace this last year. I might have nice. to mass produce that sucker. I don't know. And uh, I forget. There, there's like a Colorado flag, an Arizona flag, because I've, I've lived in those states. And they're very, uh, obviously, a veteran tied and military tied. So there's a lot, a lot of flags in my garage. So absolutely. In my in my clinic, we have a wall that celebrates our military, our firefighters, and our police. Ooh. Because freedom stands because heroes serve. Mm. And people bring their badges. And so I have a whole wall of badges from first responders, uh, from all walks of life. I love it. The hair is standing on my arm yeah. right now. It's weird like yeah, how your body reacts. Is that weird? Like, by the way, yeah. let's just pause on that. Has your arm ever just <laughs> respond with like goosebumps and hair standing up? Absolutely. It's a good thing. And why, why my, does it do that, Doc? <laughs> well, you're, you're getting your, your whole neurovascular system connected to the emotions of your brain and, yeah. and it all reacts. I mean, we all know that from, uh, from mating rituals to fight or flight. So. Yeah. 
It's, it's weird though, because the first time that happened, um, and I, I think you and I, when we first talked before today's show, I, I brought up the movie, uh, Only the Brave, that came out about a year and a half ago, honoring uh, my fallen brothers and sisters of the Granite Mountain Hotshots who got burned over in June 30th, 2013, in, in Prescott, outside of Prescott, Arizona, on the Yarnell Hill fire. And that was the worst firefighting loss since 9-11. And obviously not city firefighters, these are wilderness firefighters, what I used to do. And to this day, if I t try and talk about that movie, talk about what they did, talk about what I used to do, in relation to that movie, I get the whole goosebumps, hair standing up. It's just instantaneous. It's a psychological trigger. And I, I've never been able to explain it. I, as you just saying, it's just like, I guess it's just ingrained in us. I don't know. It's just, it's, I guess you have to live it to have it. Well, you, have a, you, you have a unique perspective of what sacrifice actually is, of what putting your body in harm's way actually is. Mm. And because of that, it's, it's not just up here, it's visceral, it's in, it's in your organs. And, um, and that's a unique perspective. And, and I love having this podcast where you're helping people to live their best lives because it's a lifestyle to live your best life. And if you're not living your best life, when things like the coronavirus hit or war or wildfires hit, then you're not going to be able to do what you need to do for God, country, and family. Yeah. And so uh, I, I just love what you do. You know, one of the things that's in my garage is a picture of Tiananmen Square. Where oh, wow. It, yeah, and that's my favorite picture of all time, where a woman is standing in front of four tanks. And that woman was killed a day or two later. But that one woman stood in front of those tanks saying, absolutely not. This is where it stops. It stops with me. And uh, that just sent chills through my body because it, it shows what one dedicated human can do uh, for this for this planet of ours. Well, it, it it's it's crazy because obviously she never set out for that reason, right? The bigger picture. I mean, I know the photograph you're discussing. I mean, it, we've seen it over the years. It has now become actually one of the many things from Tiananmen Square, but it is a piece of history. Uh, I mean, they, they are they are instilled and printed into textbooks or digital footprints now. Obviously, everything's more digital nowadays. Uh, but I think it's always important to help us all understand that if we forget our past and forget our history, how are we how are we supposed to learn from that and move forward? I am definitely somebody who does not like to dwell in the past. Uh, I love to keep moving forward and pushing forward, but I can't deny you know those lessons learned and the successes but also the opportunities we've learned from those processes right and yes there's been massive mistakes we've made over the years mm -hmm. and obviously this this is i'm intrigued obviously uh, for the for the listening audience to hear some more of that backstory behind your purpose here today and uh, but also like clearly it had to be something to fuel the fire behind your book not just because the fact you've actually served in, in armed forces and also have made those sacrifices but what we're talking about right now right these mistakes we've made in the past and how do we make the changes for a better future? Absolutely. I, you know, I had a, a lot of heartache after Iraq, uh, mm. being complicit in a war machine for a war that uh, in hindsight was not one that was perhaps justified. And, and perhaps that might be um, hotly debated, but I had a, I felt complicit in that war machine. And I feel complicit being a physician in America with the healthcare system that we have right now um, because so many atrocities are happening in America. We are rationing care more than any other developed nation in the world. Mm. And our care is so rationed that we have some of the worst health statistics of any country in the world. And it's, it's spurred this passion in me to, to try to write a book talking about my experiences in Iraq as a combat doctor my experiences in America as a physician, as a civilian physician, and then as a veteran trying to get care through the VA. And I'm trying to use compelling and interesting stories. It's about 90% story to tell 10% of public health and public health policy. I have a master's in public health. Yeah. And I was going to write this massive book about the Medicare Modernization Act of 2003 and 1986 and like all these things that brought us Tie to Tie all point. the history in, yeah. I, but I was bored. I was even bored reading <laughs> my own stuff. I couldn't get through it. So I said, okay, scrap all that. Mm. Let's talk about stories of Fallujah. Let's talk about things that were personally really hard and difficult to write about. Talk about my most uh, shameful moment in my life in Fallujah um, when I turned my back on someone who needed my care and in a trauma resuscitation and tie all of that into American healthcare so that hopefully 
use them as parables, if you will. Hopefully we can start to understand the quagmire we're in. And especially now with this coronavirus. I mean, the best thing that you can do to protect yourself from the coronavirus, maybe wash your hands and not be in the same room as someone yeah, who's cover sick. Cover the basics. But, yeah, but after that, the best thing you can do is to be healthy, hmm. to have the right body mass index, to not be overweight, to eat well. Do you know last year they came out with a study that if you consumed more than four ultra processed foods a day, now that's your chips, your hot dogs, your sports drinks, your chocolates, your candies, uh, frozen pizzas, those sorts of things. You had a 62% increased chance or increased hazard for all causes of death, 62%. Sure. And for every one ultra processed food you added on top of that, that was an extra 18%. Now, doesn't surprise me at all. No, it's the sad diet. It's the standard American yeah. diet. And when I look at what people oh, hold on. eat- Pause, doc. I've been saying this for a while. Could you please define that again for the ladies and gentlemen listening oh, yeah, to this yeah, yeah. right now? Sad diet, people. That's not a joke. It is defined. Yeah, it's the standard American diet. It just so happens to be uh, accurate. Yeah, it works um, great for marketing because it's, it's really bad. It's, we are that bad. <laughs> and, the, and the sad part, what you're talking about right now, and I have to, that's why I want to pause on it, is that societies and countries look to us for our strength. We embody a lot of strength, but also a lot of weaknesses, right? With strength sure. comes weakness. But yep. many, many societies and civilizations look to us as guidance. Because for decades, if not hundreds of years, we tried to show the world that we could lead the way. We used to be known for technology and engineering. We would lead that. Maybe not anymore. But the point is, like, we always try to lead the way. And right now, people have devalued the importance of nutrition and daily health, which impacts annual health, monthly and annual health, and lifelong health. And we, we have set so many bad examples that countries now let manu ultra-manufactured food companies into their country. Ergo, KFCs, McDonald's, Burger Kings, all this stuff is now all around the world. And it's like, guys, like, that's actually not cool America. You think that's cool America. Like, oh, we got some of them, you know, USA in our country. I'm like, no. Like, did you know that Starbucks is now the number two largest fast food company? Wow. Yeah, I as of not. this year, people didn't know that. Everybody thinks of McDonald's, Burger King, everything else. No, 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 no. Starbucks is not just a coffee company. They're actually ranked as a fast food company. My client taught me this. And he said, mm -hmm. as of last year going into this year, 2019 and 2020, behind McDonald's, because of the footprint and their successful growth and the amount of locations, Starbucks, based on annual sales and locations around the world, is now the number two fast food chain. Wow. It's unbelievable. That's, that's scary because people just think they're a coffee company. But they no, don't know. We're the fattest country on the planet by a huge margin. I, you know, human nature is such an interesting thing because all day I'm a dermatologist now. Mm -hmm. So after the military, I went to residency and specialized. And then I'm a Mohs surgeon, which means I cut cancers off of people's you said faces. said Mohs like surgeon? Mohs, M-O-H-S. Oh, yeah, after Dr. Frederick Mohs. Okay. And so I cut cancers off of people's faces and then reconstruct their face afterwards. Wow. And so... I have people coming into my clinic all day long. And just this last week, I had a very nice woman who came in who was morbidly obese. Hmm. And she had something that was really no big deal on her arm. And most, we call it a mildly atypical mole. She wanted it gone because it has probably way less than a 1% chance of ever turning cancerous. But she wanted it gone to be safe. And I, I was kind of like, you are a very nice woman and you're getting this cut out and I don't think it's really medically necessary, but she, uh, was it cosmetic as purposes for her as well? No. Cause it would leave a scar. Okay. It would leave a scar. So when, she was willing to take the scar because she was that concerned about that 1% chance. Way less than 1% probably. Wow. Yet she's morbidly obese. And I wanted to s talk and say, Hey, from a risk stratification process, this little thing, that means nothing really, hmm. unless it comes back or in the grand else scheme of things, yeah. grand scheme of things. But that's what Americans do. They rationalize and justify, maybe humans do that, but they rationalize and justify everything so they can feel good about the lifestyle that they want, but that lifestyle is killing you. And, you know, between 50 and 85% of all healthcare costs in this country are spent on treating enormously preventable diseases. 50 to 85. People say that there's no money for universal health care in this country. 
and they're hundred percent right with how things are with the fattest country in the world. And with oh, we, we waste money on things that you and I, if you were not a doctor and I didn't have the knowledge I had, if I went back in time, like these are stuff I can, I can handle most. I hate to admit it, it's based on nutrition, just how I'm fueling my body day in and day out could affect so much, so much. Oh, and it's huge. And, and just because I'm a doctor, that doesn't mean I know anything about health and nutrition. Like I'm a, Oh, let's pause on that. Come okay. on. Right. I love it when you doctors do this on my show. Cause I got to pause cause I've had ER doctors and like you name it. I've, I've had ge geneticists. Why doc? Do you not, are you as a doctor not supposed to know anything about basic nutrition and everything else? This is sad, but please clarify that for the listeners. Well, there's no money in it, buddy. Okay. So, yeah. So in medical well, besides school, the money from the educational standpoint, well, right? Yeah. So in medical school, uh, I spent less than one week learning about anything about how to prevent any diseases of the mind, body, or spirit. Nothing. Everything that I know that's not true. Probably 99% of what I know about how to stay healthy is uh, from independent research, studying, reading. You know, we spent thousands and thousands of hours learning about pharmacology and about drug companies and drug companies sponsored our education. They actually they sponsored did. our graduation ceremony. You know, it, the healthcare system, healthcare is all about treating disease and death. For that's listeners, he air my, quoted healthcare. I love yeah. it. <laughs> that's why I called my book Universal Death Care because universal death care is what we have in the age of entitlement. Americans think that they can destroy their whole body, their mind, their spirit for their entire lives and then come to us and say, give me a pill, doc. I want to be better tomorrow. And, and there's just, there's no way to do that. And the reason we don't have money for all of these things is that you destroy your body your entire life. And then you get to be 65 and then you're on Medicare age and now it's on the government's dime. Mm -hmm. And then society has to pay for your bad choices. It's like if you, you went skiing today, you drove up to the mountains, you went skiing. What if you were responsible for the person who was speeding in the car next to you? You had to pay their insurance, right? Yeah. That's how healthcare is. Yeah. You take care of yourself. You that is my healthcare. I literally pay for healthcare. My wife and I complain about it all the time. We pay for healthcare. Now, granted, last year I did have an injury. I had a spontaneous pneumothorax. I collapsed the lung. That was the first time in years of me paying for healthcare that I had to use it. Sure. But every month I go in for massage. I go in for a chiropractic care. But because of how health nutty I am, People are like, well, you don't go in for a regular checkup. I'm like, check up on what? Like, <laughs> I, I'm not, I, I, my, my friend, her husband is my MD. And he, the last time I saw him was like seven years ago. And he's like, come back in like, I don't know, seven years, but call me first because I probably don't need to see you because he did everything. He ran all the blood work and everything. He's just like, why are you here? Right? Yeah. And like, yeah. how, and how messed up is that, Doc? Hold on. When you got a patient like me walking in, you're like, why are you here? Yep. And I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> Well, it's, it's true because there's nothing to treat. So, and, and we can't talk to you about prevention because chances are you know more about how to take care of yourself than we do as physicians. I mean, I've actually are, said that on the show. I know I'm, I'm reaching, but yeah. I've gotten that angry. I'm like, yeah, I definitely know more about nutrition, how things metabolize in the body, micronutrients, all that, because I've become accountable for that. And I've Absolutely. taken that under my responsibility for my own health. And Absolutely. now obviously through podcasting for others. I know that's weird to say, but you as a, as a medical professional, I am not replacing you. What I'm doing is taking accountability to understand this, not just for myself, but for my wife and for people close to me. And hopefully to just, I'm not going to tell people what to do, but I'm going to just pass this knowledge on. And I know that's a very fine line to walk, right? I mean, I don't know. Am I wrong about this? No, you're not wrong. It's, it's, it's just sad. I mean, physicians actually get paid less money if we do not prescribe a drug. Mm -hmm. So you're incentivized. We are incentivized. And so big pharma has bought the laws that say, Hey, I can talk to you about peas and carrots or maybe more carrots because they're more keto friendly than I think a pea. But I uh, talk to you more about uh, what, what should we say? Uh, kale and carrots. No. Uh, then if I were to write you a medication for your blood pressure, to control sure. it. Yeah. And so it, the whole system, I mean, if you look at the amount of money that's been spent on lobbyists for 
quote unquote healthcare over the years, it's, it's astonishing. And it's the cycle just keeps perpetuating and the American culture, this entitlement culture of I can do whatever I want. I can smoke, I can drink, I can uh, be 200 pounds overweight and somebody else, it's somebody else's job to pay for it to make me healthy. And yeah. it's someone else's job to give me the right pill to make me healthy. That's not how it works. It's about a lifestyle choice. It's about getting up in the morning and, and purposefully planning your day, not just from a food perspective, not just from an exercise perspective, but also a how you're going to take care of your brain because that feeds the whole machine. So. It, as a non-doctor, I've been way frustrated. <laughs> I mean, beyond frustrated. I mean, it's one of the, one of the reasons why I like, live the fuel, right? The podcast show is we fuel your health business and lifestyle. Why is health first? Because if you looked over the entire history of this show, I'd say probably about 60 to 70% of the shows lead with health because everything else should follow. Like if you want to be successful as an entrepreneur, or maybe you're not an entrepreneur and you're just a happy corporate monkey like I used to be, great, do it. You know, I don't care. But like if you take care of your health, you have the energy, the focus, yeah. and the confidence that exudes into everything else you do. And people don't understand that. Like, do you, do you sometimes feel like you're bouncing your head off of the wall? I mean, are, are you long. with me on this? All day long. Listen, <laughs> I get up at four o'clock in the morning, every morning, and I go downstairs and I work out. And I'm not talking a little pansy workout. I'm talking like, you know, I'm about to pass out. Yeah, shaking get after at the it. End of it. And the rest of the day, I'm on fire, man. I mean, I am running around. I've got a smile on my face. My posture's good. People are always like, what are you taking, doc? And I'm like, I'm, I'm just working out. And I have, Hold on, let's I, pause on that. See, the first response nowadays, what are you taking? What are you on? Why is everything a pill? <laughs> well, well, let me ask you this, Scott. If you were to guess, they did a study last year on medical students. Uh, and this was in just one medical school. But how many medical students would you guess are either on an antidepressant right now and or a stimulant to help them learn more? What would you guess? Oh, crap. I mean, well, one, I, I'm not, I, listen, let me pause right now. The target audience of this show, I'm 42, you're 45, so we're Gen Xers. Mm -hmm. I believe in passing on knowledge to the next generations. So let me preface that. So obviously I'm talking to millennials and beyond. So when people hear this, as I've said in the past, don't get all pissy pants. But anyway, <laughs> the average millennials are weak. You can get upset with me all you want, but you are, okay? So toughen up, okay? Just throwing that out there, sorry. I got beat with bamboo sticks and, and flies. I mean, flies, my sensei beat me with a bamboo stick. My mom would hit me with a, with a, with a fly swatter. By the way, that's not the end of the world, a fly swatter or a yard stick, whatever. I was a wildcat kid. Anyway, everybody's now like, oh, that's abuse if you smack me. Whatever, toughen up. But back to your point about schooling. You chose to take on an educational route. Suck it up, okay? And then everybody's now like, oh, I gotta, I gotta take an antidepressant because the school load is too hard. Okay, I'm a farm kid that had nothing, then chose to go to school, then didn't have the money to go to school, so I went and worked full time so I could take classes on nights and weekends to go get an education. I'm the first person in my family to have an education. I'm like, okay, so just laying the groundwork there, right? Sure. So, yes, I'm a hard ass. I believe in working your ass off what you get. I never took a pill to make it easier, okay? So just throwing that out there, up until firefighting back in 2010, 2011, I had two to three jobs my whole life. So I don't want to hear this crap about, oh, I got to take a pill for this and a pill for that. But to answer your question, <laughs> fast forward, I don't know, 70 plus percent. Yeah, you got it. 75%. Boom. So let's, let's think about this. And, you know, I'm going to challenge you a little bit on the millennial <laughs> thing because they are more resilient in some areas and less in others. Yeah. Okay. But, I, I will pause on that. Thank you. I will agree with you on that. They are very resilient. I'm not trying to say there's a lot of people out there saying millennials are weak across the board. No, they want to be, they want to be coached. They want to be mentored. They do want to change the world. I love that passion. So I will give that fire props but you have to own your shit, okay? Oh, yeah. You gotta step yeah. up and own your shit. Don't expect a pill to fix the equation, all right? Yeah. That's our personal accountability to change the world. Am I wrong on that? No, I mean, listen, man, I, I have PTSD from Iraq. 
And every single morning I get up and I exercise and then I focus on how my day is going to go. And I say, if this happens, this will happen. You know, it's a, it's a ritual now. Yeah. If you want to call it meditation, if you want to call it prayer, whatever works for you. But I structure my day and that PTSD, those really horrible stories, a lot of which I write in the book that I can remember, they are now some of the biggest strengths that I have because my exercise, my diet, my mindset, my focus, my meditation, prayer, whatever you want to call it, that makes it better. Yes. And I use, I, I design my life. I design my lifestyle. So it is, uh, a, so all these quote unquote bad things in life, they're not weighing me down. I don't need a pill. I can do it myself. I can reprogram my brain. I can reprogram these experiences. And we I can, all can. Yeah. And I can take all that energy and put it into a book, put it into hopefully getting us to start talking to each other and figuring out these healthcare problems and these war problems, everything that we're facing right now in this country. But between the, one of the reasons I say that millennials uh, are resilient in some ways and not in others, well, so are we, so are Gen Xers. Between 40 and 80% of the physicians that you go to in your office right now are burnt out. They meet the definition of burnt out. And they push so you, the pill. And they push the pill. So I, 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 I'm going to fast forward where you're going with this, but I, I, I agree with you. It's like, I have friends who have kids and like, well, that's the first thing the docs go to. They, they go like, well, if we, oh, well, per our guidelines, we recommend this, 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 or this. And like, but the guidelines came from pharmaceutical companies. So they want you to sell the drugs. So they're giving you three choices or four choices of a medication. They're not, they're not going to suggest you a natural route. It is, oh, I got 10 minutes to inspect you, evaluate you, check, punch you out on the punch card, and here's your script to go get a pill. And don't forget all the documentation to try to protect yourself from medical legal liabilities. Mm. But it's not just the pharma, right? And it's not just medical schools not talking about prevention. It's also our quote unquote food pyramid about how oh. we're supposed to eat and how industry has has tainted that. You know that the big, big companies, and I won't mention any names here, but we all know the big companies that are on the side of the ultra process box. Of course. They have whole departments to make their food as psychologically and biologically Palatable. addictive as possible. Yep. They even have crunch factors because the more it crunches, they do this. They even have things that they put in and they do all these hydrogenated oils and they do all these fats and all of these corn syrups. They make it so that your, your satiation, you don't feel full, so that you yep. eat the whole box instead of stopping. Yep. It, it, it boggles my mind what we've allowed industry to do in this Well, they're country. hiring scientists for that exact purpose. Like, you got to oh, yeah. make this food so addicting. Yep. And, that, and I'm not holding back on that word. Because if you look at the word addicting in the psychological world, because I minored in psychology. I never went for the PhD route. But I ended up doing my, my BS in, in marketing and obviously adding – and thank God I added the psychology because the marketing taught me nothing. I, I've had to self-teach everything in the business world. But I still to this day honor the education I picked up from the university on psychology because that's a science, right? Going back to medical education, right? I tell people, I'm like, if you're going to go to college, go to college for science. In the business world, Ed, I'm sorry. I threw, I threw that crap out the window. I taught myself everything. The only thing that degree did was tell me to hunker down – put the work in and get it done, get that piece of paper. Now the psychology, because that's a science component, that taught me some things. And right. that was something I learned was the power of addiction. And to your point, these companies are hiring some of the top scientists to make food so palatable. They are figuring out all the different taste buds and then all the different ways that stimulates the brain. And it creates that addictive state. That's why Absolutely. when I tell people to try and cut sugars out of their life, they look at me and they're like, what? I was like, well, yeah, you're going to go through withdrawal, like worse than cocaine. I've granted, I've never done it, but I'm like just saying like, I've heard that sometimes the sugar withdrawal is worse than coming off of cocaine. Can't speak to it. Just saying. <laughs> so, so yeah, depending on how much is in your life, you might have a two week withdrawal, three week withdrawal. I don't know. You're going to go through some struggles because that's how good they've gotten at this. Very they've good. Got, they're, they're amazing. They're I mean, if, if medical doctors are legal drug pushers, the food industry, I, I'm not sure what you call them. I uh, don't know. Yeah, <laughs> we, got, know. we got to figure out some words for that, Regan. I mean, I, I don't know where to go with that. <laughs> I, I don't know where to go with it either without getting in lots and lots of trouble. But Oh, good point. Oh, yeah, let's pause on that. Hold on, let's pause on that. Sure. You've just been so very honest with us. Um, every once in a while when I get a great doctor like you who's so passionate and they have such a great backstory, I'm always wondering like, 
can you get in trouble? Oh, sure. Like, you, you know, is your license at risk? I don't know how this works. A hundred percent. I mean, for a doctor to admit that he has a mental illness diagnosis like PTSD, yeah. the medical board could do whatever they want with me with forcing psychiatric evaluations or, and, and they can do whatever they want. But, you know, on when we're getting, trying to get our medical license in different states, they always ask about mental illness. When we yeah. are re-credentialing at the hospitals, we have to send it to our friends, our colleagues, and ask, do you know of any mental illness problem? Doesn't matter if you went through a divorce or something horrible happened in your family, you have to self-report on your fellow physician. And so that's, that's why an accountability factor, right? You get to be personally well, accountable for that reporting process. You, you do, but that also makes it so that physicians can't get the help that they need, which means they're burnt out, which means what type of care are you going to get when you have another, you know, lung problem or you have something else that happens and you have a 50, 50 chance of your um, physician being burnt out. How good of a care are you going to get from that person who's burnt out? Wow. It's a huge right. problem. So I don't care. I am it. Listen, if, if you went to Iraq, I went to Fallujah twice with Marine recon. I was their doctor. And by the I, grace of God, every single patient who came to me alive stayed alive. Um, if I didn't come back with some, some difficulty handling those experiences, then I think that that's more concerning than having those problems. Yeah. But, you know, to go back to your point on sugar, I was walking past a friend the other day who had just a whole hand full of, Jolly Ranchers. And I looked at 2012. Yeah, no, no grown adult. Okay. And, and uh, again, has a huge problem with weight. And I, I looked at her and I said, why are you killing yourself? And she said, Reagan, I need, need was the word. I need these. No, you it, want these. Yeah. And, and here's the thing in, in our American society, crack and meth, that's not acceptable, but somehow, being obese and needing tons of medical care and putting your family and you at risk and not living your potential. Here's the big thing. We live in a great age in a great country, but we still have some very significant problems that need to be solved. If you are constantly clouding your mind, if you're constantly going to drugs to solve everything, if you are not living as healthfully as you possibly can, then you're abdicating your responsibility, not only to yourself, but also to your family and society at large. We have big problems and big issues. And America, I think, is the greatest country that has ever graced this planet. Absolutely, I agree. Rome, too, will fall if this entitlement nonsense continues. Everybody listening to this, if, you're like, if you can resonate with that woman who looks at one little health thing and you try to control that to the nth degree, and yet you drink too much, you smoke, you're obese, you do any of these things, you need to take a hard look in the mirror at what you're justifying. Yeah. And then ask yourself, is that being the best self? And it's not just about you. I mean, you'll live 10 times the life health if you're healthy than you will if you're not. But it's about all of your loved ones who you are personally letting down. If, if I can, to be honest, I want to tell the, the most shameful moment of my life. Please and do. Yeah, it's in the book. I'm in Iraq. I'm in I Fallujah. love honesty and transparency. That's what that's yeah. it, it set me free, you know. Yeah, so it, it will. So I'm in Fallujah in Iraq and in a makeshift surgical room that really wasn't fit to dissect a worm in. I mean We're talking was, like field trauma tent? Yeah, it's sort of, but it was an actual building that we commandeered. It was called Fallujah Surgical. Okay. And an Iraqi had shot some Marines. And in war, you treat the person who is injured worst first. It's triage. You, and it, it doesn't matter whose side they're on or anything like that. Well, I never lost anybody who came to me alive. So I got the most injured and I was resuscitating that person. Okay. And he had multiple gunshot wounds, you know, the typical chaos of a, of a mass casualty. And five feet away, maybe 10 feet away, was a Marine that this man shot. Oh, wow. And I, I half-heartedly treated this Iraqi, you know, violating the oath I took as a human, as a doctor, to my God, to my country, everything. And he was cold, so his body temperature was low. And he was cold because he was shutting down. His metabolic system was collapsing, his cardiovascular, everything was collapsing. It was but not a good a, way. No, there, there's a rule in medicine. 
that you're not dead until you're warm and dead. And I knew that his body temperature was something like 70, 75 degrees, and it needed to be at least 20 degrees, 25 degrees warmer before I could pronounce him dead. But I didn't care. I didn't care about this person. Maybe it was because I was tired and completely burnt out and I hadn't slept literally in months and we were taking incoming. So while I was trying well, to Fallujah, resuscitate- Fallujah is no joke. I mean, it was no joke. Yeah. And while I was trying to resuscitate this Iraqi, his, his friends were lobbing mortars and rockets and you know, they were exploding around the place and the building was shaking and dust was coming off the ceiling and not a sterile environment by any stretch, not a controlled environment by any stretch. And I could hear the Marine- 10 feet away moaning. Now, other people were working on him, but I wanted to be working on him. Yeah. So I left the Iraqi and I went to another doctor and I said, listen, I gave a, a quick uh, presentation, basically multiple gunshot wounds, hypotensive cardiovascular failing. Um, and then the other doctor asked me what his core temperature was because he had seen me do some kind of halfway measures to warm him up. And I said, I don't know, 70, 75. And he looked at me and he said, not dead until warm and dead. And I was like, we are wasting resources as a mass casualty. There's Marines who need my help. And he looked at me and said, not dead until warm and dead. And at that moment, I just wanted to beat the crap out of him. But that I doc was, was, I think was trying to get you back to that, that good place, man. That I mean, he was, and he was and looking out back. for you. Yeah. He, he went back and I, I put warm fluids everywhere and he stabilized. I got everything patched up and off to surgery and he lived. With yeah. me just caring for one to two minutes, actually investing everything that I was into this man, I was able to turn him around and then I could go help the Marines because now he was off to the surgical oh. part because they were stabilized. Good point. And then I could go help the Marines. But we have, all of us, we have these moments in life where we turn our backs either on ourselves or on each other because it's just easy. Because maybe I've got mine and somebody else doesn't have theirs, but that somebody else maybe is on the different side of the tracks than I grew up on. Or maybe they look a little different, or maybe they speak a different language. But in this country, the same sin as me turning my back on another human who needed my help because, well, frankly, I just had had enough at that moment. And, I mean, sorry, here. Doc, I mean, you're a human and I've, I've not been put in those traumatizing situations, but I, I can't, argue where you might have been at i mean sleep deprived exhausted watching your fellow soldiers getting you know beat to crap and you got one of the guys who literally beat the crap out of them i mean that's man decision processes wow it is it is and we all make these choices and yes that story in iraq is not equivalent to what's happening in america but people are dying Mm -hmm. If you look at measures for, you know, if people are healthy at 60 among all the developed nations that have universal health care, U.S. ranks almost the lowest. That's if you look at infant mortality, we rank almost the lowest. If you look at almost any measurable outcome, we rank almost the lowest, and yet we ration care worse than any of the developed nations that have universal health care. It just isn't to the people who might be listening to this podcast. The, the scary part is that, and again, since I'm not a medical professional and you and I are not in the thick of things with the corona, for example, the coronavirus issue, which again, I'm just going to go ahead and hashtag super flu. Again, I'm not a medical professional, so I know I'm probably speaking out of turn, but I look at the countries that have been most impacted, right? China, Italy. China is heavily overpopulated, densely populated. Anytime you're in a dense, like you, these guys are in cubicles for apartments, uh, you're going to increase your potential. Italy, love Italy, looking to go there for my honeymoon, still haven't been there yet. Now we, we're we not going until they clean up their act. But I have friends in Italy that own, I buy my olive oil from. And it's an, there's a lot of aging population who are old school. They still smoke the cigarettes, live their life. Let them like, okay, maybe not smoke cigarettes anymore. I mean, coronavirus preys on weak lungs. So yes. we have these choices. And, and I'm, just, I'm, I'm using Corona as an example, but, no, but that goes back important. to this country, you know? It does. So, you know, in China, people who smoked, and unfortunately, the majority of people in China smoke who are you know, older. I don't know yeah. why culturally it's that is. It's a generational thing. 
Clearly, yeah. clearly, yeah. Yep. But they Baby have about love the cigarettes. 10, <laughs> yeah, they have about an eight to ten percent mortality rate when they contact this corona, this COVID nineteen. Yeah. Eight to ten percent people who don't smoke, who are their peers yeah. and are right weight and all those sorts of things. You know, a little bit less than two percent. Well, and today my, my friend is a, she works now for some big pharmaceutical company, but she's still an active nurse. So she's one of four people in the company that still choose to stay active to keep their nursing credentials active. She's a full blown RN, ER, ER nurse, all that. And she's very knowledgeable. She actually married us, my wife and I, and nice. uh, shout out to Kelsey. Uh, but she's, uh, <laughs> she's like, Scott, she's like, you know, there, there's a, 87% plus success rate of people who contacted it in China, they're already reporting it. Like they're recovering, they're moving out of it, you know, but again, where's your health at? Cause yep. even she says as a health professional, she's like, obviously the, those rates are better if you're healthy. Like if you're healthy going into it, it's going to be another virus, another illness. You're going to bounce back. You're going to recover. Yep. All right. That's what true. are the variables that are in play that are going to reduce your numbers and your potential? Yep. So three quarters of men in this country and 60% of women in this country are overweight or obese. And we think that that risk factor is going to mirror that of smoking in China of mm -hmm. eight to 10% mortality rates. That's scary. It, 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 it's enormously scary, but what's even scarier is the vast majority of our antibiotics, you know where they're produced? China. Yeah. <laughs> and you know who has not been in factories for months now? The workers who make them the workers who make them. Yeah. And you know what? I can't believe from a strategic point of view that any quote unquote leader who is running this country has allowed us to have almost all of our antibiotics made in China. Because we it's cheaper. Because it's cheaper. Yeah, but it has to end. What but here's the thing. It's cheaper, but they still charge a buttload for it. Oh, so, yeah. So like my collapsed lung. Thank you. I paid for insurance, right? I did my part. Whereas most of the time, my insurance that I paid every single year, every single month was paying for somebody else's healthcare. But I finally needed it after all these years. I, th I found the invoice. I went through the website and did the whole, I had like a $135,000 bill. Wow. For a lot, for, for a 33% collapsed lung. I was in the hospital for eight days and then they did one little snippety snip thing. They took the chest tube out and I was good to go. But you know, obviously it was eight days of concern, but my right. point is, is like, thank, because they said, Oh, like you're like, I'm every day I'm in there, like joking around with the nurses, everything else. I mean, the chest tube through your intercostal muscles, not so fun. Uh, but <laughs> other than that, I was Mr. Uplifting. I tried to stay positive, all this other stuff. And they're like, Oh, you're gonna be out of here in no time. Cause again, I'm, I'm six foot four, 190 pounds. <laughs> I'm lean. I'm mean, I'm a CrossFitter. I could, I literally, I had just competed in a CrossFit competition before they admitted me to the hospital because I didn't know that I had a collapsed lung. That's how healthy I am. I, I have no problem. I, I brag about this because I, because I can prove it now. I'm like, dude, I competed. I did four workouts in one day with a 33% collapsed lung. And then I finally, because I finally got tired of the pain at night when sleeping, I went and got a check sex rate afterwards, five days later. And they're like, we got to rush you to the ER. You have a collapsed lung. You didn't know this. I'm like, eh, you know, I thought I had a chest cold. Because I was healthy. Yep. Because I was fit. Yep. So right? at the end of last year, I had a ruptured appendix. And oh, yeah, I heard I, that in your book, dude. That sounded awful. Yeah, it was. So I tried to walk it off for a day, right? But it yeah, turns out so I, you're, not, you're, I, you're the same idiot as me. We're just I like, oh, we'll just walk same. it off. <laughs> and I married the most wonderful woman in the world. Um, and she kept telling me all day long, go to the ER. I've never heard you groan. She sounds like my wife. <laughs> yeah. And I, I said, no, I'm fine. It's fine. It's the norovirus. It's whatever. And um, she's not medical. So you know when I'm going to hear the end of this, of her telling me to get medical care and uh, mm. me ignoring her? Yeah, never. But so I go to the ER. I, um, You're lucky. My, whole, my wife's a doctor. I, yeah. She did not let up. <laughs> she did not let up. Yeah. So I go there and I of course, try to walk in on my own because I'm not going to take a wheelchair. I walk up to the front desk and I or stagger up and I say, hey, I'm Dr. Anderson. I have a surgical abdomen. I probably have about one to two minutes before I pass out. <laughs> so they, they get me the best the part is like you literally, I, I listened to that in the book. I was cracking up on my car. Yeah. I, I was yeah. on a business travel uh, two days ago and I'm listening to it and I'm like, 
dude, this guy sounds like the same idiot as me. <laughs> Cause I literally, I had the same injury when I was firefighting years ago, but I didn't collapse the lung, but I knew exactly what it was. I had a feeling what it was. And right. then I was like, Hey, here's a situation. Here's how many days it was going on. Here's my breathing impacts. Blah, 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 blah. I gave him a lay down. And then as soon as they took the x-ray, then they knew exactly what it was. But right. uh, yeah, I did the whole thing. You walk in, you like, you break it all down and I'm not even a doctor. But, yeah, 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 it wasn't a good scene. So <laughs> while I'm sitting there waiting to go to surgery, I literally lose control of the left side of my face. I can't move my eye and I'm in a ton of pain and I'm looking at my wife going, this is really cool. I can't move the left side of my face. It's and like, she, am I having a stroke? Am I not? <laughs> but it's really cool. I've never experienced <laughs> this before. So they get in, they open me up. My whole belly is filled with pus. I mean, it just comes oozing out when they put the first incision in. Ugh. That night... Um, after, you know, I'm still drugged up. I soil myself in the bed. Right. So, so you were literally a hot mess. I was a hot <laughs> mess. And so I get up out of bed tubes everywhere and I clean everything up cause I don't want the nurses to have to do that. And so I finally, after everything is put in the corner, all the sheets, everything, I call the nurses in cause I need more clothes and I need another, um, some more sheets. And then I go for a walk down the hall. And as I'm walking down the hall after soiling myself at 45 years of age, and I'm still drugged up, and I'm, I, damn it, I'm going to get out of there as soon as possible. So I'm already walking and staggering along. You're giving me flashbacks, man. This is yeah. great. And um, then it hit me. What if I didn't have good insurance? What if I couldn't afford this hospital stay, which so, so many of Americans can't because of deductibles and because of jobs and because of insurance? I was walking down that hall trying to get healthy, but what if I was also wondering if I could put food on the table or if I'd even have a table to put food on anymore? Yeah. And this nonsense has to end. Well, fast forward three weeks later, I go to the ER again after waiting way too long because I had adhesions, which is scar tissue that's literally choking my bowel. It's killing it. Oh, wow. And I waited, of course, too long. No. And this time no, they had to you open would not, me you up. Would not wait too long. The surgery took way longer to rip rip the bow. I know, I know, I know, I know. Um, it took way longer to, to get all the scar out. And I got up to the hotel or not the hotel room to the, to the hospital room. And I told him no narcotics. I'm out of here in 24 hours. And I got up and I moved and I walked and because it, I was not going to spend one minute more than I needed in that hospital. I, agree. I was not going to take one more medical dollar worth of service that I needed. And I bounced so quickly. And I was out in 24 hours because I refused the narcotics. I got up and I walked and I did what I needed to do. And I spent a lifetime taking care of myself. I'm the same way. I, yeah. you're, you let me obviously different injuries, different impacts, different education. Um, but it, you're giving me the same, you know, I only did a couple of podcasts about it a year ago, but cause it was January when I classed my lung and we're recording in March now because I, I was literally laying on my hospital set, hospital bed because as you and I are recording, this is two days before St. Patrick's day. I will be married one year in two days, but I was laying in a hospital bed like crap in six weeks in January. <laughs> I have to be able to get on a plane, pressurized plane, right? Great with a collapsed right. lung, fly to Canada and go on a heli skiing trip in the Canadian Rockies for our wedding. I'm like, Oh crap. How do I get in and out of the sucker as fast as possible? And I'm the same way. Like, even though I had insurance, I'm, I had the same thoughts as you though, because I'm like, wait a minute, is my insurance good enough? Mm. Right? Like I was paying lower because I'm an entrepreneur. I, I literally found like the cheapest policy that I could find. And my wife was like, there's no way that's a good policy. And she's <laughs> like, you're screwed. And I said, well, it is what it is. Like you got, cause she has her own policy because it's her and a couple other female doctors and a female office manager. So they have their own thing. So I'm all by myself. And this, we hadn't been married yet. And I'm still by myself, mind you, after the marriage. And I was like, well, let's hope for the best. But like, I had some of those concerns and I have insurance. I do pay into the system. And I was still worried about that. That's why when I saw the bill later, I'm like, holy crap. Like, okay, I maybe paid like five grand out of pocket. Like, whoo, okay, I'll take it. But still five grand is five grand to a lot of people, right? Oh, it's huge. And every year, the cost of medical care far outpaces inflation. I mean, if you look at... In 1960, healthcare costs were about 5% of the gross domestic product, mm -hmm. so about 5% of GDP, and $27.2 billion is about that, about $146 right. per person. 
Today, 2017, the numbers are 17.9% GDP, 3.5 trillion with a T dollars, and $10,739 per person. It's crazy. Dude. And yeah. you look at your deductibles have more than doubled in the last decade. Your out of pocket has more than doubled. You're, you, you look at, we spend at least twice as much on pharmaceutical medications than any other developed nation, simply because in 2003, our politicians were bought off so that we can't price negotiate anymore. Nope. And Trump, Trump said that he was going to hold them accountable and allow the government to price negotiate. Now he says he's not going to. I don't know about you, but let's say you were to just so happen today look to buy a new car and you weren't allowed to negotiate the price of that car with the dealer. Do you think you'd get a good deal? No. Because yeah. again, they need their commission, right? Yeah. And this goes back to the full circle to earlier in the show when we were talking about sugars, grains, all this stuff, right? Like corn syrups, like guys, like, Think about them. Think about a locomotive. You know, once that train, I mean, we're talking about old school steam locomotives, right? Once they crank up that furnace and crank up that speed and you're cranking along. And again, people listening to this, like I'm using my arms, like the old school <laughs> locomotives. But once, once that sucker's up and going, I mean, in order to slam on the brakes to slow that sucker down, it takes a lot of braking power, but they got to build up that steam and get that locomotive going. Next thing you know, you're pulling thousands of pounds of weight. Well, that's, that's our system. And they figured out, wait a minute, as long as people are unhealthy, well, they need health care, right? Yep. Yep. Well, if, so if whether or not sugars or grains are making people unhealthy or not, they could care less. Oh, by the way, the government does make money on sugars and grains because it's subsidized products. So like they're making money on that. They're making money on the pharmaceuticals. It's a full circle process. And I'm not a political show at all. This is not a political show. I'm just speaking sure. the truth from a nutritional and health awareness standpoint. I'm just like, oh my God, this is so broken. It's not even funny. <laughs> yeah. And, and man, what I say in my book over and over and over again, listen, my first thing is book, Ray. I got to share that for the screen sharing. Yeah. Keep going. Keep going. Uh, everybody thinks because of my name, I'm Republican. I'm not. I'm an American, ah. right? So I've, I've always been an American. I will always be. People think that healthcare is a partisan issue. They think that universal healthcare is a democratic platform. No. And that the quote unquote free market that we have now is a Republican. Well, it's first of all, it is a human issue. It is not a partisan issue. It is a when you are sick in the hospital with your lung collapsed or your appendix has ruptured, I promise you, you're not thinking about who you voted or what side of the aisle it's on. It is a human issue. And if you think that having a free market system that we have now is any good, then look at all the quote unquote non-free market systems across the world. We pay at least double for our healthcare and have some of the worst health outcomes in the world. And it's by the way, not a free market because there's no price transparency. So people who want to use this socialized medicine type of talk, First of all, really, Britain is the only one that has socialized medicine. The I'd rest of them don't. Yeah. And we don't have a free market here. We have capitalism run awry. This is not capitalism. You don't have any say. You don't have price transparency. You have no control. And you better suck it up or you die. Yep. That is not partisan, guys. We need to stop playing these partisan games. We need to look at ourselves and what we need to stay healthy. That's individually. That's an individual responsibility. And then we have to get our politics behind it. Martin Luther King, you're just highlighting this on my site. Yep. Martin Luther King, which, God, what an amazing man. It's a great he, quote. Yeah, uh, this is his quote. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. And how long right. ago did he make that quote, right? Oh, gosh. Right? Yeah, yeah. Like, when it wasn't time, that bad. <laughs> like time stamping that, though, back then yeah. to where it is now. Like he, he already knew. <laughs> I mean, it was bad back then. <laughs> yeah, it's very true. It's not, so we're not picking parties and Republican no. versus Democrat. No, no. This is it's generic up. awareness. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter what party. It's screwed. <laughs> I yeah. mean, oh and, my and God. And here's the thing. So my solution is universal health care, but with accountability. If you're going to be obese, if you're going to be a smoker, if you're going to be you know, the type of diabetic that's because you haven't taken care of yourself, not because it's genetic, then yeah. it's going to cost you a lot of money to cover your own bills. Yeah. Why should everybody else pay for your mistakes? Right. Yeah. Because again, I've had multiple doctors on this show. And one of my favorite quotes now is 
uh, we're all personally and collectively accountable for our results. That was an old corporate quote from my T-Mobile days. And now I've translated it into, we're all personally and collectively accountable for our own health, right? How can I expect you, doc, to be responsible for my health? That's why when people get pissed off at their doctors because they're not healed, right? And it's like, okay, <laughs> did you help your doctor by coming in as a healthy patient? And again, I'm using health right now, air quoting it, because like, okay, did you dial in your nutrition? Have you managed your weight? Do you have a good you know, body index, you know, body mass index? Are you doing things to keep yourself healthy day in, day out? That way, if God forbid you get this weird virus or a, a medical condition that just you know, based on your DNA could have been an issue that just all of a sudden arose. Okay, that's different. Like cancer. Cancer could just you know, grab anybody. But if you could do as much as possible in your life to reduce the chances of, of getting it, I would do it. Yeah. Just throwing it out there. But not everybody takes it seriously. Like today, skiing. You said skiing earlier, right? Mm -hmm. Last day of skiing because of the whole corona thing. They're closing the mountain. So they had limited people helping sell the tickets to get on, which I already had a ticket, so I was fine. But then as soon as, right before you get on the lift, the, the, the waffle cabin was open. They had this little, <laughs> the little cabin shop serving pure sugar, you know, drizzled over sugar, drizzled over yeah. a sugary waffle to all the parents and kids before they even get on the lift. Yeah, that's really going to help your kids be extra healthy when Corona hits them in the next couple of weeks. Just throwing that out there. Yeah. All right. So it, this is interesting. It's crazy. You, you know, doctors love statistics, but um, five percent of our populace consumes fifty percent of the dollars. Okay. Yep. Wow. Now the healthiest fifty percent consume three percent of all healthcare dollars out there. That's me. Yeah. Yeah. I it's, spend it's and spend crazy. and spend. It's on auto bill out of my account. I just spend it because I have to do my part. I don't know the rest. I have no idea. I just pay because I have to. It's legal. Like, you yeah. got to pay. So, I think it's legal. Isn't it still a law? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? I just pay my part. I don't know. I think I have to pay. <laughs> but I'm doing my part. But to your point, are people taking this seriously? Are they taking no. accountability? No. And there's a lot of people who are listening to this podcast. and like, man, I, I take care of myself. I eat well. I exercise and I do whatever. Well, let me ask you this. When you did need medical care, did you actually read your consent to actually know what you were getting yourself into? Mm. When you got a prescription, did you actually read the package insert to know what the risks and the benefits and the options were? Oh, the side were? effects, Doc? Oh, the side yeah. effects? Yeah. So you have a pill to treat the side effect and you have another pill to treat the side effect from the first pill and, and it keeps going on and on and on. Like guys, we do not, we just go to the doctor. We don't ask questions. We don't take care of ourselves. We don't do our responsibility as patients to take care of ourselves and to know what we're getting ourselves into. We just don't. We just, yeah. we kind of go to the magic, magical wizard of Oz and expect them to wave their magic wand and you have Ergo, no you personal- guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The patient has no personal responsibility in anything. This just for us to snap our fingers and make it better. It, 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 it's, it's absurd. And until we start taking responsibility, until we start being accountable and forcing accountability of those who are elected and those who are taking care of us, it will never change. I hundred percent agree. I know we're coming towards the end of our slot actually, because we're, we're, you try and get these shows to an hour. So we got a couple minutes left, but um, that's the sad part. And I, and I think if I had to sum it up, and, I, and I'm going to ask you for some final words here, surely to help close it out, some, you know, legacy message, whatever. But uh, and actually, I'm going to screen share right now as I'm saying it, because I love the tagline. Ladies and gentlemen, again, the, the website is going to be universaldeathcarebook.com is the main site. And we'll have his personal site too. Um, but again, from the bloodstained sands of Iraq to medicine's fractured walls in the USA, it is that powerful. And it is that sad is that back to his point, are we taking accountability for our health? Are we showing up in our best place when we step foot into that doctor's office? Because everybody expects the doctor to cure everything. And like, no, the doctor's not the end all cure all. We have a huge responsibility and accountability for that component. And if you choose to keep stuffing your face with processed food and sugary crap, and you expect the medical system to fix you, you got another thing coming. That's just my point of view. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's guys, we, we are humans just like you. We do the best. We guess a lot. It's educated guessing, but we guess a lot. Yeah. We need partners in this. 
And again, it's not about people say, I can do what I want with my life. Well, that, that is true. You do have that freedom. But it's about, are you living your potential? Are you living your best life? What could you do if you took care of yourself? And what could you do for your family and your loved ones? What will you put them through? I, you know, I have this picture from medical school, and it's a horrible picture. And it's a patient who smoked for years, and I watched him die. And I watched him cough up the blood from his lungs and suffocate in his own blood because his lungs were riddled with cancer. The cadaver that I worked on, that I had the privilege of working on in medical school, she was like an 85 year old woman. And the cadaver right next to me was about a 40, 45 year old man our age who smoked. Wow. His lungs looked like lava rock. My patient, my 82, 83 year old patients or cadavers lungs, they were, they were supple, they were vital, they, they could still move air. When I was in that hospital room sitting with that patient dying, I saw his daughter and grandchildren watch him suffocate on his own blood and oh. cough up that blood. And we were all sitting there. Dude, that people who say they can do what they want, it's their lives, nobody else has a say in it. You spend one day in the ICU. Just one day in the ICU, most doctors will let you do it. You can shadow them. You watch what chronic disease and chronic illness does at the end to the person and the family. Actually, the person gets off pretty easily because they're usually so sedated, they have no idea what's true. going on. It's Very their true. families who's just getting their hearts ripped out of their bodies watching a loved one die. And then you think about all the other things you could have done for them, could have been for them, could have experienced with them had you been healthy. That's what we're talking about. A massive regret. Yeah. I mean, if they're a good human being too, right? Like, I mean, yeah. I would hope they have regret. I mean, I would, if I put my family through that, that sounds yeah. God awful. Uh, and I'm sorry you and their family had to go through that, but that's, that's reality. That's, that's not unfortunately the only story that unfortunately other people have had to go through. I mean, uh, that's just one of many. That's it. But there's, there's podcasts like yours. There are infinite resources on the internet. There's no secret. Free on content. How to yeah, there's Podcasts no are secret free, people. <laughs> on how to lose weight, on how to do these things. All you have to do is say, I'm worth it. My loved ones are worth it. And my country and my planet is worth it. You just have to shift your mindset, control your subconscious, like me with PTSD. Hmm. Yeah, I could be a guy, a bum on the street asking for money right now. I could have every excuse in the world for that. Instead, I'm controlling it and I'm working towards it every day. And guys, you can too. I don't care what your mental illness is. I don't care what your past is. Your future is what you create of it. And listen to these podcasts. Have intention for your life. Build the life of your dreams and then help others accomplish it for them. Well, I normally ask for some final words, but I think you just nailed it. <laughs> well, Listen, Doc, hang tight. I want to give you a uh, proper goodbye off the air. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, I, I've been podcasting a long time now. And I'm going to screen share one more time here because I actually, in my onboarding form, asked my guest co-host to provide some powerful, a powerful quote. And I don't even know if Reagan provided it separately or not, but I don't care because his main site, again, ReaganBAnderson.com. That Martin Luther King quote says it all, man, of all forms of inequality and justice in healthcare is the most shocking and humane. And again, back to the other site for the book, universaldeathcarebook.com. Tie it all together, people. I mean, we all have a choice in life. All right, take action, get informed, get educated. This podcast was free. I don't think it's that big a deal to go score an audio book or a book in general. Read, listen get informed, get educated, become a better person for not just for you, but your family, your loved ones, and everyone else there. And uh, Dr. Reagan Anderson definitely helped us do that today. Again, check out the book, check out the feed, check out his sites. It'll all be linked on livethefield.com on his show notes. So again, ladies and gentlemen, we're here to fuel your health, your business, and your lifestyle. We rocked the mics on health, but it ties together with everything. So again, you two can live the fuel. And we're going to talk to you guys again soon. Thank you.